Our Father, we bless your name because of the privilege we have again to come and study your word. We praise you because you have given us the interest, the desire to know more of you. We are asking that as we have come here tonight, the Holy Spirit will apply the word to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. For us who are believers, may we learn to appreciate the word of God more. Learn to live by its precepts more, so that the study, the teaching of your word will draw us closer to your side. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're examining the concluding verses of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, which, by the way, is also the conclusion of Peter's sermon. This is the second time that Peter is standing before a large crowd of people and preaching to them of the great truth of the gospel of the kingdom of Christ. The first time the people were gathered by a miracle and this second time again the people were gathered by another miracle. At the first time he was preaching, you remember there had been the miracle of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And as the Holy Ghost came upon 120 waiting disciples, they began to speak in other languages which they didn't learn before. Because of this, there was a great amazement and wonder in the hearts of all the people around that heard. And therefore they all gathered together and he was saying, what meanest this? And there was a question and an answer was required. And because of that, Peter rose up and he gave the very first sermon after Pentecost. Or after the power came on the believers. Now at this time in Acts chapter 3, they were going to the normal hour of prayer. To the temple to pray, Peter and John. But then as they were going into the temple, they saw a man at the beautiful gate. Joseph first tells us that, that that gate is about 75 feet high. And, and uh, he was looking at them as if he was going to get something. But then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, I give unto you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Do you know that that man by the power the authority of the name of Jesus rose up and started walking. In fact, he held on to Peter and John. Peter on one side, John on one side, and you know, he was just in the middle, jumping and leaping and walking and praising God. Now the multitude had been seeing him there all the time. Therefore they were amazed, they were surprised at the sign, the wonder, the miracle that had taken place. They were looking at him and obviously they were also looking at Peter and John. Again, the miracle got them into a surprise, into an amazement. Have you seen what the two miracles have done first? The miracle at Pentecost, speaking in tongues, to the miracle of the healing of the lame man. The miracles did something for the multitude. It made them to be surprised. And he left every other thing they were doing. The miracles caught their attention. But then, they were looking at Peter and John as if by their own holiness or power, they have done this. Again, there was a question in their mind. And therefore, Peter started to speak. And it happens that the message was just a sermon. And two weeks ago, I told you about the sermon that Peter preached. And listen to me, two things he emphasized. And in every apostolic message, every message preached by an apostle, two things were emphasized. One, the exaltation of Jesus Christ, and two, the conviction upon the people as sinners. He exalted Jesus Christ and he called him by six different titles. He called him the very servant of God, the ambassador, the representative. He called him Jesus because that is the name the angel had called this son of God before he was even born. Then he called him the Holy One, the Just, the Prince of Life. And in fact, he said he is the Messiah, he is the Christ. And I told you two weeks ago that 
in calling him by the six different titles he associated with each title a statement i told you that the first title as servant used in Isaiah, used in matthew uh, means ambassador or representative and he said god dignified his son in calling him christ i told you he said god has declared his son he dignified him he declared him to be the son to be the christ to be the messiah but then the other four titles he picked up and then he used these four titles and then he used it against them he said this jesus the deliverer who should have delivered and redeemed you you delivered him to the romans to pilate to the soldiers to crucify him and he said, you denied this Holy One. You should have supported him. You should have embraced him. But you delivered him up. You denied him. You desired him not. And then you destroyed the Prince of Life. But, but you know how he turned around in verse 17. After he had exalted Jesus Christ and had brought them up under conviction. He then said, now, brethren, he softened out. He softened this message. He drew, he drew them nearer. He said, I know that through ignorance ye did it as did also your rulers. I told you two weeks ago that that meant he was opening wide the very gates of the city of refuge, spiritually speaking. He was saying, yes, you did it. You crucified him. Are you asking the question, is there any hope for us? Because if a man kills, then he must be killed. Then he reminded them a provision has been made in the Old Testament. If you killed a man through ignorance, you didn't know what you were doing, but you just killed him out of ignorance, then you can get into the city of refuge. And as long as the high priest is alive, you'll remain alive. And maybe you are saying, but they didn't do it through ignorance. Oh yes, they did it through ignorance. You say, but I saw that those people were just rebellious people, wicked people, who delivered up Jesus Christ because of envy. Listen to me. One way, they were not ignorant. They knew what they were doing. One way, they knew they were killing somebody. They knew they were killing a great teacher, a great prophet. They knew they were killing a miracle worker. They knew they were killing somebody who had preached great sermons and worked great miracles. But... What they didn't know is that they were killing the Messiah. They didn't know that this is he. You know, there was question all the time about the personality of Jesus Christ and about the ministry of Jesus Christ, about, you know, the real position of Jesus Christ. You see the one we're expecting, or you see another person. They knew they were killing somebody that was innocent, a prophet, a teacher, a miracle worker. They knew they were killing somebody who was the most merciful person Israel had ever known. But what did they did not know is that they were killing the Christ, the Messiah, the very ambassador and representative that was to deliver them. That's why Jesus Christ prayed on the cross of Calvary saying, Forgive them. They know not what they are doing. Oh yes, they knew they were killing a person, but they didn't know that that was a redeemer and deliverer. And that is what Peter was making use of when he said, I know that through ignorance you did it, as also did your rulers. You didn't know that that is a servant, did you? You didn't know that that was the Holy One prophesied about in Isaiah, did you? You didn't know that that was the just one. Did you know that? You didn't know that that was the very prince, the author, the giver, the originator of life, did you? Neither did you know that that is the Christ, the Messiah, that Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Osea, Amos, all your prophets talked about, you didn't know. Because of that, he comes to verse 19. And you see, this is what every preacher must do. Number one, exalt Christ. Number two, convict the people. Bring them under the sense of guilt and condemnation because of what they have done. But you don't leave them dangling in under condemnation. You bring the hope so that their faith can have something to hang upon. You bring them the hope so that they'll be able to hook on this thing you are telling them 
and he'll be able to seek the face of the Lord for pardon and for the mercy of God. And therefore, in verse 19, he says, Repent ye therefore. Because you did it in ignorance, repent. Because you did, you committed the greatest crime ever committed by man, repent. Because the Lord is still willing to forgive and is still willing to overlook what you have done, repent. Listen to me. You cannot preach repentance if there is no hope that God will forgive. Why repent? Why turn away? Why beg the Lord for mercy if the Lord has made up his mind that you have gone beyond, you have gone beyond mercy and grace and love and you are not going to have mercy at his hand? He says, because I've thrown wide the gates of the city of refuge, there is only one thing left for you to do. You are to repent. And you know you cannot preach repentance to somebody that does not feel guilty because you know you are guilty now. You have killed and destroyed, denied, delivered up, and you have not desired the very prince of life, your deliverer, the Messiah, the Christ. Because you know you are now guilty, what are you to do about it? Repent. And so he tells them on, in this passage, and in the passage I'm going to tell you the, God's message, God's Messiah, and God's mercy. It's the conclusion of his message. It's the very climax of his message. But then he removes every doubt as to the person and the ministry and the mercy of the Lord God and of the Lord Jesus Christ for them. And he tells them, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when, or in the Greek, so that the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Two things there, repent, the other one, be converted. One is the human side, the other one is the divine side. They are both active words. Repent, that's what you do. Be converted. That's what God does. You hear people saying, well, so and so converted me. No, that's wrong. You hear people saying, I went to the retreat. Or I went for a conference. Or I went for, to a crusade. And you know, the preacher converted me. No, sir. A preacher does not convert. A man does not convert. A soul winner does not convert. That is the very work of God. What you do is you repent as the human side. And what God did, does is that he converts, he changes, he transforms your life. That's the work of God. One is human, the other is divine. Now, let me pick up these two words. Repentance and regeneration. You're turning away from your sin and God turning to you in mercy and changing your life. Do you know that whenever you are preaching the gospel, whenever you are approaching, uh, you know, the message of the word of God to sinners standing before you, there is something you must never forget and that is the word repent. That is the very term that links us together with God. In this a passage we have seen, it says, Repent ye therefore. Repent ye therefore. It's something you can do. It's something you must do, and it's something you have to do if you want the mercy of God. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30, And the times of this ignorance God winged at, but now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. You know, again here, just in those two verses, Christ is exalted because he's exalted to the position of, you know, the judge of the whole world. And then he says as, a motivation for you so that you will escape judgment. What are you to do? Again, this is the very conclusion of apostolic preaching. You are to repent. You are to turn away from sin. You are to come to hate your sin and run away from it. In Acts chapter 20, verse 21, Paul tells us what he does. He says, 
I testify both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You hear that? Repentance toward God. Uh, to repent means to change your mind. It means to turn around 180 degrees. It means to turn in the opposite direction. And it means, you know, if you are facing your sin, you turn away from your sin. If you are turning your back on God, you not turn around and you face God. If you are denying Christ, you turn around, you embrace Christ. If you are rejecting Christ, you turn around and you accept Christ. That's what repentance means. Change. Turn around. Change your attitude about sin, about God, about Christ, about the Bible, about life. If you were thinking, well, I'm the owner of my life, I can do whatever I like. No, change your mind in repentance and say, no, God has the authority over my life. Change your mind, change your attitude, and change your actions. You know a man that, has, that is not changing his attitude towards sin is not repenting? A man that is not changing his actions, his activities of sin, is not repenting. You know, a man that is not changing his approach and his relationship with God, you know, is not repenting. What's your attitude towards idol? Towards the world? Towards Satan? Towards life that now is? And towards eternity? Towards heaven? Towards hell? You know, it's when you change your attitude... In all these areas, that's what repentance means. It's a change, it's a turning. And then it says, faith in God. The repentance seems to be something, in human language, negative. You are turning away from something. But faith is that you are embracing someone. And that's positive. And those are the two sides of the coin, really, that brings you what is called salvation. In... Um, Acts chapter 26, verse 20. Paul is here witnessing and talking before Agrippa the king. And he says, But I've, sh I've showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God. You hear that? They should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance listen to me repentance will start on the inside it's an internal attitude an inward an inward change or transformation an inward change of you know your attitude and your disposition but then it brings out works that are suitable for that repentance people can see it on you that you are changing your mind, you are changing your attitude, you are changing your relationship, and you are changing the activities and the actions of your life. And here he says, you should repent and turn to God and do works that are meet for repentance. The word in the Greek actually means you are turning in the opposite direction. And Peter was exhorting the hearers to, to reverse their decision about Christ. And you know, it was a great change. Now, please listen to me. I find today that some religious people find it difficult to repent. And they find it difficult to repent because they are counting the cost. They are weighing, the, uh, they are weighing their decision. They say, well, if I repent, what will that mean? Take yourself being a Catholic person, for example. Understand me, I love Catholic people. In fact, I have, you know, some people who have been close to me um, in life being Catholics. And some of them are just very nice, naturally speaking. But now I'm talking on doctrine, I'm talking on Bible, I'm talking on the presentation of Jesus Christ as the only way to salvation. And there is no other person that shares in the chair, that shares in the work of redemption. That's the point I'm making now. As for the people that go to the Catholic Church, uh, we love them, really love them. But now we're talking on doctrine. You know, there are people going to the Catholic Church, and when you present Jesus Christ to them, they begin to consider the consequence if they change their mind, the consequence if they, if they embrace Jesus Christ as the only person that can save, the only Redeemer, the only Christ, and that there is no other person, man or woman, Mary or Joseph, sharing in the work of redemption with Jesus Christ. And, you know, some of these Catholics, when they consider that, they say, well, if I believe that, there will be so much trouble for me with my wife, with my husband. You know, sometimes repentance is very costly. 
and for the Jews. You know why they killed Jesus Christ? They killed him because they thought he was a blasphemer. They killed him because they felt he had an evil spirit. They killed him because they felt he was misrepresenting God. And now Peter comes and then Peter says, I know what the Pharisees have told you in the synagogue, in the temple, from house to house. Change your mind. Change your mind that he's not a criminal. You know what that will do for a Jew? It will make him to turn against all the priests and the high priest. It will make him to feel that he's taking a different position from Pilate, from Caesar, from Herod. He was literally going against everybody in the nation. It was a cost they had to pay, a price they had to pay. And yet Peter told them, don't be afraid. This is the Messiah. This is the Christ. Change your mind. And you know what I'm telling you, my friend, if you're just a religious friend? You've been going to church all your life. And you are feeling if I change my mind, if I repent, is it not costly? My friend, very costly. Very, very costly. Because, you know, your husband may not agree with your decision. Your wife may not agree with your decision. And your neighbors may not agree with your decision. And your religious colleagues, and fellow churchgoers, may not agree with your decision. In fact, you know, for these Jews that were changing their mind, repenting, it meant that some of them were cast out of the temple, of the synagogue, because they were embracing the, pe the person that the priest and the pi and Pilate and everybody had called a criminal, an injurious person, the person they felt had the spirit of Beelzebub. They were turning around calling him the Messiah. The Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, the servant, the ambassador, the representative of God. It was a change of mind that was very costly. But do you know, many of them repented. That's been bold. You know, when you repent, when you repent, it's a bold step. And I'm praying for you tonight, you'll be able to take that bold step in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, what does God use to make us repent? Do you know sometimes when you want a little child to do something, you prod that child, you pet that child, you plead with that child, you are moving that child and influencing that child to do what you want him to do. And you know sometimes, in fact many times, all the time, God does that to us. He prods us, he pleads with us, he begs us because of his pity. Uh, and he uses many things in making us to just turn around, to change. You know what he used on the people here? Miracle. Because they saw that lame man who had been about 40 years of age. They saw him rising up. And he used that to tell them, this Jesus is alive. The name of a dead man cannot raise the dead. Your priests are telling you that he stole his body from the grave, that he did not rise from the dead. Can the name of a dead man make a person that was lame to rise up? Don't listen to your priests. He rose from the dead. Christ is alive. And it's the name of the living Christ that has made this man, this man to be alive and to, to rise up from his sick bed. He used that miracle, God used that miracle to bring them to himself, to turn them around, to even be willing to listen. Not only miracles, he uses his word. You know what Abraham told the rich man in hell? When the rich man said, send Lazarus to my five brethren back in the world. So that if they will see a person that will come from the grave, they will turn, they will change, and they will repent. And Abraham said, listen man, they have Moses, they have the prophets. If they do not listen to them, they will come to the place where you are. That means God has given us his word. He uses miracles to turn us around. He uses his word to turn us around. Then number three, he uses sorrow for sin. You know, sorrow for sin is not repentance. I hope you don't think sorrow for sin is repentance. There are many people who are sorry for their sins in the prison. They come out of the prison and they are the same. They go to steal again. They are sorry they get into punishment. They are sorry for their crime. They are sorry they got into trouble. But sorrow for sin isn't a change of mind. But you know, God uses guilt, condemnation, the pain, the sorrow of what you have done before to turn you around. And that's why the apostle says, 
that it was very good you were sorry for your sin because there is sorrow uh, godly sorrow that leads to leads to repentance it's not repentance but it leads to repentance and God uses that guilt, that condemnation, that pain you feel after you have committed sin. He uses that pain and that sorrow for sin to turn you around. But then Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says, he uses his goodness. You know, his goodness in various ways. He provides for you. He heals you. He delivers you. So that at the, on the judgment day, every mouth will be stopped. Just is being good to you. And this is supposed to lead us to repentance. But then in Revelation chapter 3 verse 19 we're told, As many as I love, I rebuke. I chasten. Therefore repent. Be zealous and repent. He uses chastisement. You know some little children that will not do what you want them to do until you apply the weed. And there are some adults like that. Children in the hands of God. Little ones to the hand of God, but they may be 40 or 50 or 60 years of age. And God has to resort to the, to the use of the weak, chastisement, to turn them around. And some backsliders, they have to be, you know, turned around by chastisement. And sometimes he uses a fear for final judgment. That's what I read to you in Acts 17, verse 30 and verse 31. Because of the coming judgment, he says, repent because the day has been set up when he will call all sinners to judgment so he uses miracles he uses his word he uses sorrow for sin he uses his goodness he uses chastisement he uses the final judgment as well to turn us to repent now when we repent what really happens what's the result of repentance acts chapter 3 verse 19 repent ye therefore and be converted Repent ye therefore and be converted. Let me give you this illustration. The prodigal son had been far away from home. Where he was, he suffered. But you know, while he was suffering and hungry, he still depended on the husks that the pigs were eating. He will not come back home. But then the chastisement, the problem became so much and it was that chastisement it was that suffering that turned him around that's what i've just told you you may change because of the miracle you have seen we have many people here who said uh, you know i saw what the lord did he just healed people i had so many testimonies at bagada and i just felt that i should change and turn to god the miracle turned me around other people, you know, they are here and they say, well, I came to the Bible study. I came to the Sunday worship. I had the word of God. And the word of God became applied by the Holy Ghost on my heart. It turned me around. Other people just say, you know, I felt so guilty, so condemned. The pain of my sin, the sorrow for my sin was so much upon me. I began to weep and I repented and turned around. Other people just said, uh, the goodness of the Lord was so much. My husband lost his job. We were, we were just about to quit our, our house. And, uh, you know, the children were sick. And all of a sudden, as if we knew how to pray. All of a sudden, as if your heaven just opened and just concentrated on us alone in the whole world. Uh, my husband got a job. I got, uh, you know, a gift of money. And then we were able to pay a house rent. And you, the Lord was so good. He healed all our children. We just decided... We're going to serve the Lord. That's the Lord turning the people around with his goodness. But you know, some come, some turn around, some change, some repent because of chastisement. The prodigal son, the hunger was so much. The suffering was so much. And he eventually said, how many hired servants of my own father are feeding at home. And here I am, dying away with hunger. I will go to my father. I will say unto him, I have sinned against one, against heaven. I'm no more worthy to be called your child. Make me one of your hired servants. And he came back home. What's that? That's repentance. He changed his mind. He changed his attitude. He changed his action. And he began to walk back home. But listen to me. This is my illustration. I was, as he was walking back home, his father saw him afar off. He ran. He met him. He embraced him. He accepted him. It is that running from the Father, that embrace from the Father, that acceptance from the Father, that peace from the Father, that joy, that peace, that 
accept times that he gave him into the, ble into the best of the blessings at home that we call conversion. What God does for the repenting sinner, for the one that has come back home. And this is what God does. He says, and be converted so that your sins may be blotted out. The blotting away of sin is the result of repentance and faith in Christ. Isaiah 51. I'm reading there from verse 9. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out, blot out, blot out all my iniquities. Listen. Do you sometimes write down something on a sheet of paper and then a time came that you needed to rub it off and you rubbed it off after one week after one month that that thing had been blotted out or erased out or rubbed off you tried to remember that thing you picked up that paper you set it against the light and if you, if you use glasses, you put your glasses on, you squeeze your eyes, you try to remember because you think you need what was written there and all in vain. However, you squeeze your eyes, you put on your glasses, you try to remember, you cannot recollect because you have blotted it or you have erased it. Listen to me. If you are saved, that's what God has done. All your sins that were many, he wiped everything off. He erased everything. You know, in the olden days, they wrote on papyrus. Uh, we write on paper today. And the ink they were using at that time did not have acid. You know, the ink we use today has acid. That's why it, it sticks into the paper. It actually bites into the paper. That's how it stays. But the ink of those days did not have that acid in it. And whenever you want to rub it off, you just take, you know, some sponge and uh, you put it in water and you just rub that wet sponge on it and everything will totally clear away. And you want to remember, you want to recollect two months or two years after that, you cannot recollect anymore. And that's what God has done for your sin. After you have repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's wiped off by the blood of Jesus Christ and how that needs to make you to rejoice because God can't remember them anymore. You know sometimes after you are born again, maybe you become sick or something happens to you. You say, well, maybe God is remembering the sins I committed before. Listen to me. That's a lie. Well, that's because of your ignorance. He's blotted them away. It's er he has erased all those things. And he cannot bring them to remembrance anymore. You know, he's, he, he, David was praying. I said, blot out all my iniquities. And in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake. I will not remember thy sins. Look up at me here. You know, if an angel rubbed away your sins, you might feel maybe a little part of it remains. But the Almighty, God Himself, that's the meaning of grace and mercy and love and loving kindness. God himself, he says, I, even I, if you are saved, if you have repented, I am he that blotted out thy transgressions for mine own sake. And I will not remember, I will not remember thy sins. Verse 26, put me in remembrance. Of what? Your sins are blotted out. I will not remember your sins against you anymore. Then in the very next verse it says, Put me in remembrance of what? After you are saved, you go before God and say, Oh God, I want you to heal me. I want you to bless me. I want you to answer my prayer. Uh, but I, I remember I'm an unworthy fellow. I'm a sinner. I know you are forgiving me, but I'm a sinner. Is that what he's saying? Put me in remembrance? No. 
Those things are blotted out and I will not remember them anymore, but put me in remembrance of my covenant relationship with you now. Put me in, my rem in remembrance of my promises unto you. Let us bleed together. Let's talk together. Now, sit down in front of me here. Don't cringe and crawl. Don't hide under the table. You are now my child because you are forgiven. And I don't remember your sins anymore. They are blotted or they are erased. They are taken out of my sight. Sit down. Let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. And in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 22, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me. Let's have a nice time together. Fellowship together. For I have redeemed thee. That's what the Lord has done. If we have called upon him. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Verses 13 and 14. And you, being dead in your sins... And the uncircumcision of your flesh, as he quickened together with him, having forgiven, it's done already if you are saved, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And so, when we have repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, He forgives. He blots away our transgressions and iniquities. He remembers them no more. We're justified, we're forgiven. We have peace with God. We have access into the very presence of God. Now come back to Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. Notice what follows. When, in the Greek it says, in order that, so that, the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Paul, sorry, Peter was telling them something here. Now for you as a believer, you may not understand exactly what we read here. But you know what he's saying. Listen very well so you can understand. They were expecting the kingdom. Isaiah talked about it. And he said the government will be upon his shoulder. When the Messiah comes, he will rule and reign. He talked about it and he said, at that time, the desert will become a wonderful forest. And there will be springs all over. Then he said, even the lions will feed with the lower animals, the sheep, the oxen. That even a little child will be able to play in the pit of a snake. He said it will, it will be a, such a wonderful time. There will be universal peace and protection, preservation, health, holiness, joy. He said all you have desired you will be able to find when you get into the kingdom. Jeremiah talked about it. Daniel talked about it. And he said, I saw, you saw that hand. The interpretation is that the Messiah, when he comes, the ruler, the king, when he comes, he will dissolve the kingdoms that were before him. And he will establish a kingdom that will never be toppled by any human being. Osea talked about it. Joel talked about it. Amos, Obadiah, Micah, and uh, Abacog, Zephaniah, all the prophets talked about this coming kingdom. And the Jews were expecting it. And you know what they call that time? A time of refreshing. Everything will become fresh. The cause will be taken away. And all the mark of, you know, Satan ruling this world, all those marks will be taken away. It will be a time the curse is reversed. It will be a time of the restoration of all things to the original state before the curse came. And he called it a time of refreshing or restoration or restitution of all things. 
And now, you know you cannot have the kingdom without the king. Now that we have killed the Messiah, is there still any hope for the millennial reign of that Messiah? And now Peter is telling them the hope is still there. John preached about it, repent, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You rejected it. Any hope yet? Jesus came and he preached about it. He went all about and said, believe, repent and believe the gospel. For the kingdom is at hand. You rejected him. He told many parables that the God sent his servant. You killed them. He said, I will send my son this time. But you took his son. You killed him. Any hope? In fact, you know, the disciples were asking Jesus before he eventually went away. They said, will you at this time bring the kingdom to Israel? And he said, it's not for you to know the times and the season that the Father has just uh, reserved in his own hand. And he's there telling them, the kingdom is still coming. It's suspended for a moment, for a time. But you know, that time of refreshing, it will come from the presence of the Lord. God will send Jesus Christ, which before was preached, the Greek says, which before was appointed unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the time, the fixed appointed time of the restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. This is real hope. But he was telling them something. The time will come, but you must repent first. What did Jesus say? Matthew chapter 23. Verse 39. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth. I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth. Look at verse 38. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Does that mean God has totally forsaken Israel? The house is left desolate. The nation is left desolate. And it says, ye shall see me no more henceforth. Does that mean the Israelites are forever lost? No more hope for them? Listen to what follows in verse 39. Till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Oh yes, a time is coming when Israel will repent. A time is coming when Israel will want the Messiah. And then Jesus said, you will not see me until you as a nation will say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Peter was saying, you've killed the Messiah, the servant, the ambassador, the representative of God. Jesus Christ, the Holy One, the Just, the Prince of Life, Christ. But you know, if you repent, as Jesus has gone to heaven, he'll come back. And the times of refreshing will come. The time of the restitution of all things will come. The millennial reign will start if only you will repent. But it depended upon their repentance. Let's see Zechariah chapter 12. That's second to the last book of the Old Testament, Zechariah. Chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication. What's that? They will repent. And when that repentance comes as a nation, it says, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. They will repent. After that repentance, look at verse, chapter 13, verse 1. In that day, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness, there will be forgiveness after the repentance. In that same chapter 13, verse 8, And it shall come to pass, that in all the land, says the Lord, two parts 
therein shall be cut off and shall be cut off and die. But the sword shall be left therein, and I will bring the sword pass through the fire, and I will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried, and they shall call on my name, and I will hear, and I will say, It is my people. And they shall say, The Lord is my God. How do they come to that? Through chastisement. I told you, the way repentance comes to different types of people, and in this case it's going to come on that nation through chastisement, and then they will call upon him, the remnant, and then he will say, these are my people, and the people will say, it is my God. And in chapter 14, verse 4, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the mount of olives. Do you understand what we're reading? In, in chapter 13, sorry, in chapter 12, verse 10, it says, They will look upon me, whom they have pierced. That's the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. In chapter 13, it says, Two thoughts of them will die. That's the tribulation period. And then it says, The remnant, the one thought remaining, will say, Oh, yes, we call upon the name of the Lord, and God will hear, and they will be forgiven. National repentance. And now in chapter 14, his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. That's the return of the Messiah. Oh yes, repent and be converted. So that the times of prostitution, the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. After you have repented as a nation, he will send Jesus Christ who before was appointed or preached unto you. And in that verse 4 of chapter 14, his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. In verse 9, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, that's his millennial reign. The kingdom will be established, and the Lord our Jesus Christ shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. Acts chapter 3. So he was telling them that if they will repent, they'll be able to get into the enjoyment of that kingdom. And you know, today, if you repent, if you call upon the Lord, You'll be counted among the faithful few. You'll be counted among the people who are going to enjoy with the Lord in his millennial reign. Right now there will be peace in your heart. There will be joy in your heart. God will protect you and preserve you. And if you're sick in your body, he'll heal you. What uh, the people, what, the, what Israel is waiting for um, at the time of the millennium, it will be happening to you in your heart, in your life right now. And then when the millennium comes, we'll be enjoying all the people of God. Now let me go to the fact that Peter emphasized that Jesus is the Messiah. Chapter 3 of Acts, verse 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you, of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Peter reminded the people that the rabbis have taught them that the Messiah will definitely come. You know, the rabbis believed that Messiah was coming. They believed the Old Testament. The only problem was identifying who the Messiah is. Because at the time of, uh, since the time of the Maccabean revolt, in the Dark Age, that period, the 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, many people have been rising up saying, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Messiah. And, you know, even at the time of Jesus, I said many people came in my name saying, I am the Messiah, but they are thieves, they are robbers. So when Jesus came, they had difficulty. They wanted to know if this is the real Messiah. And they had difficulty identifying him. They believed that the Messiah will come, but John said, I doubt the person. Look at Matthew chapter 11. major problem was whether Jesus was that Messiah, the Christ. 
Matthew chapter 11, verse 2. Now when John had heard him in the prison, the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Are thou he that should come, or do we look for another? That was the confusion. Are you the Messiah? Are you the Christ? Are you the one that should come that the prophets talked about? In John chapter 10. John chapter 10 from verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem the feast of the dedication and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Look at verse 24. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us very plainly. Don't leave us in the dark. We want to know whether you are the real one that we're expecting. How long are you leaving us in doubt? If you are the one, let's crown you as king. And let's uh, you know, throw up Caesar and Herod and Pilate. And in verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. And so Peter now emphasizes this part. And he tells them, Jesus is that Messiah. Is that Christ. And this is in fulfillment of the prophecy of Moses. He said, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, underline the words, like unto me like unto me have you ever tried to compare the life of Jesus Christ and Moses when was Moses born when Israel was under foreign rule under the Egyptian rule when was Jesus born when Israel was under foreign rule under Roman rule like unto me when Moses was born what was the king in Egypt trying to do to kill all the children and they would have killed Moses when Jesus was born what was the king trying to do to kill all the children so he can kill Jesus like unto me but where did Moses find a refuge in Egypt under the care of the daughter of Pharaoh where did Jesus find refuge in Egypt like unto me that's what peter was saying he said we lived with jesus we know the history and the ministry of jesus the very life of jesus jesus came to fulfill and he fulfilled that prophecy that a prophet will rise up and it's like unto me like unto moses what did god say about moses that man the servant of god meek above every man on the face of the earth meek What's the character of Jesus? I am lowly and meek. Jesus like unto Moses. What does the Bible say about uh, Moses? He was faithful in all mine house. What does the Bible say about Jesus Christ? Very, very faithful in all his house. Like unto Moses. You remember when Israel had committed sin. And Moses knew about it. And God said, let me wipe them up. Just remove them and I will make you a great nation. What did Moses say? Moses said, forgive these people. If you will not forgive them, blot me out of your book, which you have written. He was willing to pay even for the salvation of the people. What did Jesus do? He paid for the sins of the people. Forgive them, Father. They know not what they do. You remember that Moses went to the mountain and he saw, the very fa he saw God. And you know, when he was just behind that cliff of the rock, he said, let me see your face. Let me see your glory. And he saw so much of God that when he came back from the mountain, his face was shining. They had to cover his face because before they would look at him. What does John say about Jesus? He said, nobody had ever seen God Almighty. The only begotten of the Father, Jesus Christ, he has beheld him, he has seen him, and is declaring him like unto Moses. And so you see that when you look at the life of Jesus, a, a particular preacher, a particular theologian has given us about 27 similarities, comparisons between Jesus and Moses. And that is exactly what Peter was saying. He said, this Jesus is the real Messiah because he is the one like unto Moses. And in Acts chapter 3, verse 23, and it shall come to pass. 
that whosoever, every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. So he told them, you have no excuse. Jesus is the Messiah. He's still buttressing the fact, supporting the fact they must repent. They must change their attitude about Jesus Christ. Now he tells them about, about the mercy of God. Verse 25. Ye are the children of the prophets. You see how soft that is? How inviting that is? It says now, your fathers predicted of this Messiah. Your fathers, the prophets, were looking for the time the Messiah will come. You are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. And unto you, first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, not to kill you, to destroy you, to judge you, in turning every one of you away from his iniquities. How did they respond to this message? God's message, God's Messiah, God's mercy. Look at chapter 4, verse 4. How be it? Many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. They said, Peter, if that is so, we we'll change our mind. If that Jesus is what you are telling us about, and it is uh, that Jesus that has raised this lame man, what you are telling us, you have used the name of the living Christ, our Messiah. We crucified him, but the Lord raised him up. And he wants to bless us and turn us away from all our iniquities. What are we doing in sin? We repent, we turn to the Lord, and 5,000 men turn to the Lord. And tonight I've told you about Jesus Christ, and I've told you, it's not redeeming you in conjunction with Mary or with a bishop, or with a priest. He is the Savior, the only Savior. He is the high priest. He is the bishop and the shepherd of your soul. And if you will turn to him and just change your mind, and just say, oh Lord, I want to give my life to the Lord, do you know he will save you and change your life? He will save you and convert you. He will change you and transform your life entirely. And my question is, what are you waiting for? Why do you tarry so long? Your Savior, the Messiah Christ, is waiting to give you a place in a sanctified throne. Do you ever hope to be saved, to gain anything except to come to the Lord Jesus Christ? There is no other one that can save you except Jesus Christ. There is no other way you can be saved except you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I know you feel the Spirit of God striving within you now, stirring you up, saying, you must give your life to Jesus Christ. Why not accept his salvation then and throw off your burden of sin? Nothing to wait for. The harvest is passing. The Savior is longing to bless you. There is danger and death if you delay. Rise up and let us pray. He is a Savior. No other Savior. He is the only one who can save. And to be saved is very simple. Repent of your sin, call upon the Lord, and say, I turn away from my sin, I change my attitude. That's all. And the Lord will change you and transform you and convert you. He will. He will. If you will only repent, call upon him. Have mercy upon me and his mercy will be for you.